Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone. Welcome to the SIOP Childhood Cancer Early Diagnosis and Appropriate Referral CEDAR webinar on Burkitt lymphoma. My name is Claudia Sampor. I am a pediatric oncologist from Argentina. Uh, I, my special interest is retinoblastoma, clinical research and uh, trials. Uh, I am an active member of the SIOP, uh, SIOP uh, Education and Training Committee. Uh, I have two co-moderators today, uh, Mr. Neil Ranashingi. He is a parent of the survivor of childhood ALL. He's involving in advocating for children with cancer and their families in the UK and low resource settings. He's leading the SIOP Global Health Network Education and Training Working Group, and he's an active member of the SIOP Education and Training Committee. The second co-moderator is Professor Angus O. Markey. He's a lymphoma survivor and a pediatric hematologist at the National Children's Cancer Service in Dublin, Ireland, since 1997. He did his practice uh, pediatric and pediatric oncology training at Mayo Clinic and UCSF in the USA. He has a special interest in childhood ALL and myeloid leukemia in Down syndrome. The SIOP CEDAR project is a collaboration between SIOP and IPA, and the aim is to improve the knowledge and understanding of general healthcare providers about the initial care of pediatric patients suspected of having cancer. Today, we will hear practical advice from oncology experts from around the world on how to identify children with the suspicion of Burkitt lymphoma at the earliest possible stage. We will have simultaneous Spanish translation, so you can choose your uh, language of preference after clicking the globe in the bottom, right bottom side of your screen. February is a special month for us. The World Cancer Day will be celebrated in February 4th ne next week, and the International Childhood Cancer Day will be celebrated in February 15th. We have three speakers, great speakers today. The first one is the Dr. Mangai Susela from India. She will, uh, she will present the case scenario. Uh, follow that, a lecture by Dr. Chantal Boga from Burkina Faso. She's going to present about when to suspect Burkitt lymphoma. And finally, Dr. Asim Belgaumi from Pakistan will present a lecture about approach for diagnosis, initial management, and referral. The, we will have a panel discussion with great uh, experts, Dr. Andish Atarbachi from Austria, Dr. Monica Mechter from USA, and Dr. Morty Andriastuti from Indonesia. We have some housekeeping instructions. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, there were there will not be uh, no there is no voice option for the audience but you can post your questions at any point of the webinar in the uh, Q&A box. Those questions will be answered from the ex by the experts during the session, either uh, by, in writing or in, in a live uh, way. All the participants can receive a CMA certification through SIOP after completing the evaluation. Uh, well, let's start. Uh, I wish you all a very interesting webinar. And it's a pleasure for me to present Dr. Mangans, Ma, Mangai Susela. After completing her medical graduation and master degree in general medicine from Tamil Nadu, South India, uh, Dr. Susela is currently pursuing res residency in medical oncology at Cancer Institute Adyar Shenal Tamil Nadu in India. She is representing SIOP Global Health Network, young in, la in low and middle income countries working group. Welcome, Dr. Uh, Susela. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Dr. Mangai Susila from Cancer Institute, Chennai. Today, I'm presenting a case of Burkitt's lymphoma. This is a 14-year-old boy who, in June 2022, had developed symptoms of abdomen pain and abdomen distension. 
and he went to a hospital nearby and they had done an imaging which showed a bowel wall thickening in the uh, ileocecal region. So he was seen by a surgeon and he underwent a right hemicolectomy. So this happened in August 2022. After the surgery, patient's abdomen distension and abdomen pain relieved. So he became asymptomatic. So he did not report back to the hospital and the post of histopathology was not collected. Two months after the surgery, in October 2022, Patient has recurrence of abdomen pain and abdomen distension with new onset symptoms of headache and blurring of vision. So for the following complaints, patient went to the nearby hospital. So he was diagnosed to have hypertensive encephalopathy, acute kidney injury and obstructive uropathy. Imaging done at that time, it showed a bowel wall thickening in the operated site in the right iliac fossa, suggesting a local recurrence with a retroperitoneal nodal mass. And also around the kidneys, there was perinephric fluid collection with obstructive uropathy. So the post-op histopathology of the surgical specimen was uh, checked again. So it showed intermediate sized atypical lymphoid cells infiltrating into the full thickness of the bowel wall. With the suspicion of a lymphoma, the hospital did not have the resources to manage the patient. So he was referred to our institute six months from the time he, st he started developing symptoms in November 2022. So at presentation, the problems we faced were the oncological emergency the child had. He had he was an aneuric acute kidney injury. So he needed to be started in renal replacement therapy. So we managed the patient with the renal replacement therapy with an anti-tumor lysis syndrome measures and his renal failure part settled. And then simultaneously, his obstructive uropathy component was also managed with the bilateral percutaneous nephrostomy and the urinoma collection around the kidneys was drained through aspiration and subsequently through pigtail drainage. For the primary disease, the biopsy slides were reviewed at our institute, which was suggestive of Burkitt's lymphoma. Staging workup wise, bone marrow showed 27% atypical cells and CSF cytology was negative. So he was diagnosed as Burkitt's lymphoma, stage 4, group C. So the child was managed with um, initially pre-phase chemotherapy, which included rituximab, cyclophosphamide, vincristin, and prednisolone, and short pulses of chemotherapy with the addition of doxorubicin in the second cycle. And the subsequent cycles, after uh, we had added methotrexate, after the urinoma collection was drained. And uh, uh, so this case, as we can see, uh, is, uh, shows the problems which are unique to low and middle income countries with a delayed diagnosis leading to an advanced disease as presentation at presentation and multiple challenging complications this child had faced. And this also emphasizes the need to increase the awareness among the primary care physicians and an early referral to a tertiary care center. Thank you, Dr. Mangai Susila, for getting us up and running. I now have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Chantal Buddha to you. Dr. Chantal Buda is a paediatrician pedi practicing paediatric oncology since 2008 in Burkina Faso, head of the paediatric oncology department at Yalgaudo Rodrigo University Hospital, Burkina Faso, member of SOBUPED, member of Burkitt's Lymphoma Committee in GFAOP, and member of SAO. It's a great pleasure for me to share with you this important uh, session about Burkitt lymphoma. First, we are going to give some characteristics about Burkitt lymphoma. Remember on lymphatic system, epidemiology of Burkitt lymphoma. Burkitt lymphoma is non-Hodgkin lymphoma, mature B cells lymphoma. It is a proliferation of marine lymph lymphoid cells developed predominantly in extranodal tissues. It's very aggressive and has very fast growing with a very short duplication time. It involves early central nervous system and bone marrow. The lymphatic system is network that defends the body against disease. It has three components. The first one is lymph nodes. The second component is lymphoid tissues and organs that include thymus and bone marrow that are the primary organs, adenoids and tonsils that constitute valdez wings, spleen, 
appendix and pear patches that constitute lymphoid tissues associated to the STSE. The third component is lymphatic vessels. Epidemiologically, bulkit lymphoma, bulkit lymphoma is found all over the world, but it's more common in the bulkit belt in sub-Saharan Africa, where it represents more than 50% of childhood cancer. When to suspect Birkitt lymphoma? Clinical manifestation of Birkitt lymphoma predominate on two sides. The first one is abdomen. That is most affected in almost all publications. Head and neck localization is the second site and it's more found in Sub-Saharan Africa. Then, come other sites with the risk of early invasion of central nervous system and bone marrow. The age of occurrence of Birkitt lymphoma is around seven years old. It's rare before two years old. And clinical presentation is usually an increase in the volume of abdomen, sometimes preceded by abdomen pain, mass perception by patient or parents, and clinical evidence of mass and or ascites. The second site of localization for Birkitt lymphoma is head and neck tumor. It can manifest as dental pain, followed by gingival hypertrophy and mass in the mouth. Disorganization and tooth loss. And finally, maxillary swelling. The other sites of head and neck tumors are Consular enlargement revealed by examination or an orbital involvement. And sometimes we can have cervical lymphadenopathy. Some patients consult after those two main sites of Birkitt lymphoma. Some patients consult at the stage of neurological manifestation, which includes central nervous involvement as cranial nerve pulses, decreased visual acuity, paraplegia, other neurological signs. Bone marrow involvement is announced by bone pain or another signs of bone marrow failures, such as anemia or hemorrhagical syndrome. Burkitt lymphoma can be revealed by an emergency, like acute antisusception announced by pain and occlusive syndrome. Compressive complication has respiratory distress by voluminous head and neck or mediastinal tumor, pleural infusion or ascites, digestive compression, compression by large pelvic tumor or ascites, spinal cord compression, and then sometimes tumor lysis syndrome can reveal bulkit lymphoma by oligoanuria. Clinical outside of 
emergency, other more rare sites of tumor may reveal burkitt lymphoma. Testicles, peripheral lymph nodes, thyroid, breast, members, thoracic. The list is not exhaustive, and all of these two more sites may or not be associated. In paraclinical level, two examinations can support the suspicion of Birkitt lymphoma. Ultrason is a very good examination to guide the diagnosis and extension of lymphoma. It describes the lesions and intestinal tightening, their size, their, leader, their relationship with the organ, splay, liver, kidney, ovaries, other sites, adjacent lymph nodes or acetis, and in all those differential diagnoses has nephroblastoma. X-ray describes bone lysis, mediastinal involvement, and pleural infusion. In conclusion, Burkitt lymphoma can be suspected in a child of school age presenting recently a few weeks to a few months, an abdominal mass preceded by pain or reveal, sometimes by acute interception, with or a maxillofacial mass with a dental pain, tonsillar or orbital starting point, with or another localization that may can be early in the central nervous system or bone marrow, or compressive complication or tumor lysis syndrome. This constitutes a diagnostic and therapeutic emergency that requires a reference in pediatric oncology for management. For the end, I would like to thank Sarah for the honor that was made to me by this invitation. All of those who are following us at the moment, the patients of the department, caregivers of the service, I thank GFOP and Dr. Catherine Pat for her valuable advice and constant support. Thanks all. Well, thank you, Dr. Buddha. Um, it's always a great pleasure to hear from a true expert and uh, you certainly qualify as that because I think you've seen more Burkitt lymphoma than anybody in Western Europe. I, I spent a month in Tanzania and I have to say I saw more, more Burkitts there than I would see in a whole year in Dublin. So um, thanks very much for that, that insight. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Asim uh, Belgomi now. Uh, Dr. Belgomi is at the Aga Khan University Hospital um, and is a professor of pediatric hematology and oncology there, and also the Dean of Clinical Affairs at the Medical College. He's the president of the Pakistan Society of Pediatric Oncology and a past president of a, a wider group in the, in the Eastern Medi Mediterranean. Uh, he's also highly involved in SIOP and his interests are leukemia and lymphoma. So I look forward to hear your presentation and uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Markey. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my slides. All right. So um, I really want to thank the, the, our, our, the first two speakers because they've made my life easier because a lot of what they've said really um, helps me go through the rest of the management quite quickly. So the first thing, and this is really um, the point, the last point that Dr. Chantal Buda made is that Burkitt lymphoma 
is an emergency. There's an urgent timeline that we need to follow. Uh, this is the fastest growing tumor in humans. Uh, and the treatment and outcome is dependent on the stage. And as time goes on and disease spreads, the stage increases and there is a requirement for more intensive therapy. Um, and so the earlier, the faster um, the patient can be referred for appropriate um, um, uh, diagnosis and management, the better the outcome is for the patients. All right, so what do we wanna do? right up front. What are the initial things that need to be done? Well, a CBC with a differential. Um, and I think that is really important uh, because that, that and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go into how to come up with an initial diagnosis. Um, uh, and and as, as, as Dr. Chantal um, said that um, not infrequently the bone marrow is involved and if the bone marrow is involved, uh, very likely your CBC is going to be abnormal and any abnormalities in the CBC should point towards a possible bone marrow involvement. BUN and creatinine, just renal function studies. Again, we've seen that there are multiple reasons for uh, renal dysfunction and we'll talk a little bit about that, both in Dr. Mangai's um, uh, uh, case that, was, that presented uh, as well as what Dr. Chantal talked about in both of them, there, is a, there was a significant mention of renal dysfunction. Uh, electrolytes, particularly potassium, and again, related to tumor lysis, same thing with calcium, phosphorus, and uric acid that is available. Um, and of course, lactate dehydrogenase, if that is available to, um, uh, to the practitioner at your institutions. This is just an indication of how widespread or how rapidly growing the tumor might be. Um, again, we've talked about chest X-ray and ultrasound abdomen. Um, you want to see whether there's a mediastinal mass. This is an unusual um, uh, involvement of uh, in, in Burkitt lymphoma, um, as well as lung parenchyma, which is a rare late uh, disease uh, involvement. However, it's important to, to at least get a plain film of the chest uh, because that gives an idea of, of how the patient is doing. Um, also, you, with the chest, uh, X-ray, you will be able to see, you will be able to assess the, the trachea, um, not so much in Burkitt lymphoma, but we've seen this is that because of head and neck tumors, you may have tracheal deviation and that will impact on the, the possibility of respiratory dysfunction. And as you move further towards your management, whether you can or cannot provide any sedation to that patient for procedures that might be required. Um, ultrasound abdomen, is there a mass? Has the mass resulted in any organ obstruction, whether this is intestinal or urinary? Um, is there any abnormal echogenicity of the renal parenchyma? Because that's another reason for renal dysfunction, not just from tumor lysis, but also from infiltration of the renal parenchyma by the tumor itself. Um, how do we come up with a diagnosis? Well, really, you've got to choose the most accessible source of tissue. If there are abnormal cells in the peripheral blood, the peripheral blood becomes a really good source for that. You don't need to do any sedation or any procedure or any invasive procedures. A blood sample is able to tell you whether this is a Burkitt leukemia or not. If not, you go to superficial lymph nodes. If there are abnormalities in the, in, in the, in the CBC without any abnormal cells being seen, so platelets are low or anemia is there. Then you've got the bone marrow, which becomes an accessible tissue. Um, again, um, where you can't do excisional biopsies, excisional uh, tissue sampling, you, need, you can do core biopsies of masses. Um, now, we don't want FNAs because you read that, that then uh, has the potential for um, for, for incorrect diagnosis or missing the diagnosis, uh, and a needle biopsy where you get a core would be useful in here. Again, you want to go for biopsies that provide tissue. This could be either incisional if there is tumors or excisional if there's a smaller lymph node that is available for easy access. Um, again, I want to caution that this is not a surgically treated disease, and so uh, heroic surgeries that remove large masses uh, should not be taken up here. 
you should try and ensure that you have adequate tissue before you start any treatment, if you are going to start any treatment, for example, steroids. Um, because this tumor is very, very steroid responsive. And sometimes if treatment has been started without appropriate diagnostic material being collected, you may end up with no tissue diagnosis because the tumor has essentially melted away with the steroids. However, if there is a life-threatening condition and you are unable to, to retrieve um, a, a, a diagnostic sample, then we don't start. We don't delay starting treatment and the treatment should be started because um, you know, if your patient succumbs to the life-threatening condition, then there's no tracing to treat anyway. So you've really got to uh, be, 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 be astute about how you take this forward. So both in the case that was seen and as mentioned by Dr. Chantal as well, um, you can, a lot of patients will present with intestinal uh, symptoms and intestinal obstruction becomes something that one would need to deal with fairly urgently. Intersusception, because these tumors can occur in the ileocecal region, um, and as was, was, was in the case as well that Dr. Um, um, Dr. Mangai uh, presented, um, the, the patients can present with intersusception and obstruction due to that. Um, if the tumor is small enough, um, and oftentimes patients with, who are presented with intersusception have fairly small tumors, uh, you can actually do a radiological reduction if that is some a, a facility that's available within your institution, or they can be surgical reduction uh, of, of that intersusceptum uh, and resection of that tumor. Oftentimes, when you when you when when a limited resection is done, the surgeon is able to do a end-to-end -end anastomosis, and the patient um, then uh, can be referred forward. Uh, Certainly bowel obstruction, otherwise they can be complete or partial obstruction. You've got to look for ruptured bowel in there. Uh, the, the, the most important thing is here that one needs to consider is if the patient can be managed using conservative means. If possible, surgery should be limited to only retrieving diagnostic material. And really, again, no heroic surgeries, no large bowel resections, um, uh, avoidance of of, of uh, uh, creating stomas or colostomies, et cetera, as much as possible, because that will hamper further treatment for these patients. Um, resection should aim to relieve the obstruction. So do not attempt to remove all tumor. Try and do a primary anastomosis and the removal of small intestinal tumors will result in a downstaging. So if there's a small tumor, for example, one that one might see in an intersusception, um, your surgeon can go ahead and do a limited resection, um, and that would result in a smaller tumor load for the patient and easier treatment. Urinary tract obstruction, the patient that was presented earlier, actually the second time when that patient came back, uh, was, with intest was with urinary tract obstruction. Uh, this can be ureteric obstruction because of a mass. Uh, it can be unilateral or bilateral, again, depending on where that tumor uh, is actually uh, causing the obstruction. These can be treated with, with uh, you know, ureteric stenting or urinary diversion, pigtail stent uh, uh, tubes can be placed in there just to allow that the, the, uh, the urinary flow for that patient proximal to the obstruction. Renal infiltration um, can either be because of um, the tumor infiltration within there, and this really a lot of time will require lymphoma-directed treatment if this, is, if this is pure renal uh, uh, obstruction, intrarenal obstruction, oftentimes these patients may require hemodialysis until a, uh, the kidneys can actually be opened up. Um, tumor lysis, as was again seen uh, in the case that was presented, um, can happen resulting in urate nephropathy, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And what's very important to note is that this can happen even before any treatment is given. Definitely the risk is much higher once, any, once, once treatment is given, but particularly in Burkitt's lymphoma where the cells are, are rapidly multiplying and dying normally as well, you can have tumor lysis happening before any treatment is provided to them. So tumor lysis syndrome, 
So the tumor lysis syndrome is a result of cell death and release of intracellular chemicals. Uh, the most important intracellular electrolyte is potassium. And so these patients can and often will present with high potassium. Um, there's release of uric acid as a consequence of purine degradation. Uh, and this crystallizes at low pH within the, 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 the kidney. And this can result in renal tubular and glomerular obstruction because of crystalline deposition within there. This results in decreased urinary flow and allows for more precipitation. So really results in a, in a cyc cyclical um, damage to the kidney. Hyperphosphatemia, which leads to hypocalcemia. Uh, and actually hypocalcemia is more concerning than hyperphosphatemia. And that can result in muscle cramps, stetany, and seizures uh, that these patients may have. So the aim for any patient with suspected Burkitt lymphoma is to diagnose and safely transfer to a treatment facility. And the reason for that, that is to avoid disease progression, as I talked about earlier. You've got to prevent or manage consequences of tumor lysis syndrome, treat acute life-threatening conditions, and then transfer safely. So what do you do? Hydration, making sure that the urinary flow is there. Usually we will use 3000 ml per meter square. Alkalinization that used to be practiced earlier is no longer considered essential as long as we have adequate hydration and urine flow. You treat the, hyper, treat the hyperkalemia, potassium binders such as K-exalate. Um, it's very important that potassium not be added to routine IV fluids. Um, we, we should accept lower levels of potassium. So if a patient comes in, has a potassium of 2.9 or 3, I'm very happy with that. Um, and really significant hypokalemia uh, should be treated with bolus doses of potassium rather than infusions that run all day long and preferably oral boluses rather than IV boluses. Monitor cardiac rhythm, provide IV calcium, dextrose with insulin, albutrol nebulizers. These are all things that one can use to decrease the hypercal hyperkalemia. Uh, reducing or preventing um, hy uh, hyperuricemia uh, again, this is just the purine, purine um, pathway, metabolism pathway, uric acid, which is the end product for mammals and humans, um, is really what causes the, 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 the problem here. Allopurinol, which has been used for over half a century now, actually, 60, 70 years, actually, um, really results in a block of the enzymes, anthene oxidase, which prevents the formation of uric acid. More recently, rasburicase is used, uh, which is a enzyme that is not found in mammals, but is found in birds and reptiles uh, and results in the conversion of uric acid to allantoin, um, which is very, very highly renal, uh, 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 water soluble, and therefore it reduces the uric acid. So talk to the oncologist at the referral center. And I think that is key call them up, write to them quickly and get in touch with them. Make sure that they, they can guide you um, in, in, in what is the best way to transfer this patient. Ensure that your institution can handle the problem, handle problems that may occur with the treatment. So even if it is utilizing steroids, and if your institution does not have the, the ability to take care of, of um, renal dysfunction, such as uh, as a result of hyperuricemia, that probably may occur with any kind of treatment, even with low-dose steroids, um, then you may be better off postponing that till the patient can actually be transferred there. Um, we can use low-dose methylprednisone, but the, it has to be very judicious dosing with very careful monitoring. Um, again, um, you may, you, you know, hemodialysis may need to be done. And surgery oftentimes may need to be done when there's intestinal obstruction, just to relieve that intestinal obstruction. So thank you. And I'll be happy to take questions. And the panel, of course, will be happy to take questions as we end with this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Asim Bagawi, for the great presentation. And first of all, impressing how, in, how urgent it really is. I'd just like to say that this, I'm going to repeat this later on, but all, this session will be available as a video on YouTube not sure when it'll be uploaded, but it'll be uploaded fairly soon. 
So I'd now like to introduce Andish Etabashi. Dr. Andish Etabashi is an assistant professor in paediatrics and adolescent medicine, senior consultant in paediatric and haematology and oncology. He has been contributing as study coordinator and principal investigator for several Austrian leukemia and lymphoma studies, specific area of interest in training and expertise in paediatric haematology and oncology, and has a vital role in SIAP Europe educational offerings. He's one of these people you meet who doesn't sleep and he just spends all, every hour of every day helping children with cancer. And I salute you. Right, away you go. Thanks, Neil, for this very kind <laughs> words and, and invitation. And I think after uh, having seen these three great talks, it's not so easy to add so many things uh, to this topic. But if I'm allowed, I would like to mention two aspects. Uh, uh, the first one is dealing uh, specifically with with the patients with abdominal tumors who are uh, not always, but uh, often present with intersusception. And I think if we have a non-infant presenting with an intersusception in combination with an increased LDH or uric acid level, there are not so many alternative diagnoses possible than Burkitt's lymphoma. I think uh, this is uh, uh, also very important to always um, take into account this combination. I think there are no other diagnoses possible. And the other thing what I would like to mention is uh, because uh, all the speakers uh, said that Burkitt's lymphoma is an emergency, which is definitely the case, is that we don't need the histopathology to make the diagnosis of Burkitt's lymphoma because we have many patients presenting with uh, malignant effusions like acetus and pleural effusions. You can just take the fluid, do a cytospin, look yourself into the microscope. I'm doing this every day and diagnose uh, Burkitt's lymphoma. And even if you don't have a, a malignant effusion and you take a, a sample during the operation, before sending the sample to the pathologist, you can make tumor touch imprints on a slide, do the staining, according to Pappenheim, look into the microscope, and then you see the classical work itself, and you can start uh, uh, the treatment according to your protocol. So it's not needed to wait for histopathology uh, in many situations, because the Burkitt cells have a, have a very characteristic uh, morphology, which is not so difficult. Yeah, these are the two aspects I would like to, to add uh, to these three great talks. And, and thanks for allowing me to be a member here in the panel list and take part of this session. Thanks, Dr. Atarbashi, for sharing your excellent opinion with us. Next, I would, I would like to introduce Dr. Uh, Dr. Monica Metzger. Uh, she is a pediatrician at Medicine Sans Frontier, having recently completed her first assignment in the Democratic Republic of, of Congo. Previously, she worked for over 20 years at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, where she, wa she was a full member in the Department of Oncology and Global Pediatric Medicine. Her areas of expertise are lymphomas, particularly in Hodgkin lymphomas. She mentors juniors, faculty, and helps develop lymphoma protocols in Latin America, India, and South Africa. Welcome, Dr. Metzger. Thank you very much, Claudia, and thank you very much um, to all the panelists and, and the participants. I am overwhelmed by the number of participants to the seminar, so congratulations, Mohammed and Claudia, for organizing this. This is incredible. So I have just a couple of comments, I would like to thank Dr. Mangai, Dr. Shangai, Chantal, and Dr. Asian for their presentations. What stood out for me on Dr. Mangai's presentation, um, case presentation, was really um, a health system failure. And, and we don't speak often enough about, about the health system failure. We, we put the burden on the parents you know why didn't he why didn't the parents come back and check the um the histopathology but in reality was it really the patients or the parents um 
um, responsibility to do that when they don't understand, maybe were not even explained um, what the consequences are, or maybe even what the disease was. So I think I think it is important to put more responsibility on the physicians and to provide a network that will prevent a patient to fall through the cracks. So so I think I think we need to to start focusing a little bit more on the on 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 the whole network and not and not um yeah and not maybe just blame it on patient education um dr chantel thank you very much for the nice summary of diagnosis and presentation of burkitt lymphoma including the epidemiology and the clinical challenges particularly in africa as as claudia said i just spent six months in africa and and i can tell you that um yes we we did see some 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 um some Burkitt lymphoma of the jaw. Unfortunately, there was nothing that we could offer, not even prednisone for these patients. So, so they were, they were, they couldn't be referred to a place where they could be treated. But one of the one of the things that 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 um, did call my attention is the acute abdomens and perforations that we see in Africa um, that that maybe um, we don't see in other places, and these are secondary to typhoid fever. So, so not every acute abdomen is going to be a Burkitt lymphoma, and so that is that is um, something also to keep in mind. And of course, Dr. Asim, what a wonderful presentation on the management diagnosis of Burkitt lymphoma, as well as of its complications. So, thank you so much for having me. It's it's really an honor to be part of this panel. That's great, Monica. Thank, thanks very much. And I have to echo my um, uh, gratitude to everybody who's uh, contributed to this. And I have to say the practice that I've heard about here uh, absolutely mirrors our practice in Western Europe. Uh, I, I, I might speak more about that uh, towards the end, at the very end of the, uh, the webinar. But um, I need to introduce Dr. Murthy uh, Andrea Stuti, who is from the University in Indonesia. Uh, she's uh, uh, an active faculty member there and is also involved in the Indonesian Oncology Association. Uh, she's academically very, very active and has peer reviewed or has co authored and mentored many, many papers in uh, peer reviewed journals. So I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marke, and then uh, thank you everybody for uh, this opportunity for me to join this session. Uh, I want to uh, make a point of view for, from the uh, case from the Dr. Mangai. I think this some, sometimes happen also in, in, in my country because I think that is very important this uh, award, awareness uh, from uh, how to uh, uh, got the early diagnosis to this is uh, this is malignancy or benign because this very from history taking we can differentiate between uh, is this uh, malignancy or is this benign from the from the tumor so this is very important from uh, the uh, the general doctor to know about this from the history taking and also uh, we can uh, check from the physical examination and then from the initial uh, laboratory examination. And then uh, we can uh, think first, this is uh, about malignancy, then we can revert them uh, as, as soon as possible because when we suspected this is uh, malignancy, particularly uh, lymphoma, this is the, like uh, Dr. Uh, Belgaumi uh, talked about, the, the, this is the fastest growing from the, uh, one of the cancer fastest growing. So we have to refer uh, this patient as soon as possible to get the treatment, to get the, I mean, the, the diagnosis that uh, uh, have to make to, uh, to make sure this is the malignancy that, uh, that what, uh, what kind of malignancy, because we have a lot of uh, diagnose, uh, differential diagnosis from this uh, from these lumps that the uh, uh, patient uh, from the case presentation from uh, Dr. Mangai. And then uh, after 
after uh, surgery, the patient uh, took the surgery. I think this is uh, uh, apa, is uh, this is the uh, they have to uh, to to look for the the pathology after uh, they did the surgery. I think this is also the the miss in this time. So patient didn't come again, and then the no, I mean uh, not control again to the hospital. So we don't know about the what kind of the from the tissue that uh, already take out when when the patient uh, get the surgery for this uh, for this uh, for their uh, lump. So we we miss this uh, time period around three months uh, so this is very i mean uh, yes we, the, the the disease can uh, can spread anywhere and then uh, uh, the prognostic maybe will uh, uh, going uh, will go bad because the i mean this is the delayed diagnosis but uh, i think uh, uh, like uh, in our uh, medical uh, site also make, uh, I mean, the delayed diagnosis and also the treatment, not only because of patient, uh, not only because of the patient, but also from our side. So this is very, very important to, to, uh, to uh, give education for the uh, maybe general doctor or general pedi pediatrician from awareness to be uh, how to the early uh, detection, early signs of the uh, malignancy, and also how to how to refer the patient as soon as possible. If we suspected this is uh, malignancy, or we doubt about this is malignancy or uh, benign, so we must think uh, first this is malignancy. So we have to refer uh, the patient as soon as possible. So after that, uh, the doctor from the uh, the, the bigger uh, hospital or for cancer center can make a certain diagnosis. This is a malignancy or not. I think uh, uh, that's very important from the case that uh, Dr. Mangai already presentation that we can learn from that case. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anastuti, for your valuable insights. I think we are ready for the Q&A session. There are a lot of uh, uh, questions, very interesting questions in the Q&A box. Um, Isabel Villaradi uh, wants to know if we know why Burkitt lymphoma is more frequent in Sub-Saharan Africa. Dr. Atarbashi, do you want to answer that question? Please. I think I would leave this question perhaps uh, to someone else because this is not um, my field where I can answer this uh, uh, properly. I don't know whether Monica and uh, or um, my other colleague can answer this question. Yeah, well, I would suggest that it's the effect of uh, EBV, yeah. um, which is very prevalent in uh, Sahara or Sub-Saharan uh, Burke. It. We have EBV in Western Europe as well, but we don't see the same incidence of uh, EBV-driven Burkitt lymphoma. So perhaps there is some predisposition to EBV-driven lymphoma in Sub-Saharan Africa. And it's a combination, I'd say, of a, an inherited predisposition and the, pres uh, the presence of the virus. There is also um, a, a relation to the, to the malaria belt. So, so it's also malaria plays there a, a role as well. Can I just add to everyone, if you're adding questions and we don't get a chance, we might not get a chance to answer all your questions, please add your email to the question and then we can get your questions answered after the session if necessary. Because you see there's quite a few questions in the question and answer box already. So if you just add your email, we can get back to you afterwards, if necessary. There was a very interesting question about how to differentiate between tonsillar involvement by lymphoma versus chronic tonsillar hypertrophy by infection. Monica and Dr. Angus, do you want to make some comments about that? So, so unless, 
and unless there is a, a change in stage or risk stratification, um, it really it really doesn't matter unless this is the only place where where the, the lymphoma is 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 um harboring and then you need you need again um histo histologic confirmation when i say histologic and as as um um andy also said before you can just do a touch imprint that will show you if indeed there is there is burkitt lymphoma so it's not even a very complicated um way of 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 uh, proving that there is that there is involvement or not. Now, if the patient has other sites of involvement, whether the tonsils are also involved, really doesn't make any difference anymore. And so, um, and so, so I, I wouldn't, you know, if it is if it is an, an asymmetric enlargement, then that speaks more towards okay, that's probably lymphoma than if it is symmetric. You cannot go by the response to chemotherapy because even hypertrophic tonsils will respond to chemotherapy, so that will not help you. Um, particularly to the steroids. So, but I see that Andish has also a comment on this, so I let him talk. Uh, no, no, I, I, I just remember a case at, at my ward myself, and it's, it, it, it's, it's specifically referring to what Monica said. If you have a unilocular tumor or, on one of the tonsils and no other manifestations, of course, you need to do something to get the diagnosis, but you don't need to do a tonsillectomy. We just did. Uh, a tumor touch imprint had the diagnosis, and we, uh, we confirmed by Fish that it was uh, systemic rearranged, and we gave two blocks, and the patient was cured. But this is a very uh, re re this is a rare situation. And in the other cases, as Monica said, if you have other manifestations, you have the diagnosis. Um, you don't need to confirm that the tonsils are involved or not. Yeah, I, I agree entirely, and. Um... If you've got the diagnosis elsewhere, you don't need to worry about the tonsil that much, and it'll rarely move you, upstage you. Um, it certainly won't move you from B, group B to group C, unless you've got CNS or bone marrow disease. So I would just treat, probably treat as if it is, and um, then cut back if it turns out not to be. Okay, I've got, I've got a question for you, Andish. Um... So this is from Bang 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 Mang in Indonesia. My name is Bang Bang Sudamanto, Indonesia. Can the peripheral blood smear used to monitoring and evaluation of MRD in Burkitt lymphoma? I saw the question already in the chat and I, I'm not sure whether I understood it completely. Usually Burkitt's uh, lymphomas do not spread into the peripheral blood, even if it's a Burkitt leukemia you usually have no Burkitt uh, cells uh, morphologically visible in the peripheral blood. So uh, blood smears cannot be used to, to, to monitor disease. Of course, uh, there are more specific methods uh, like uh, PCR-based methods by which uh, we, have, um, we, we, we try to monitor by the uh, gene fusion uh, the disease in the peripheral blood and uh, in the bone marrow, but currently this is not used e even in Western Europe and I think also North America to, to stratify patients, although there are a few pa has papers have been published that minimal disseminated disease in the bone marrow and peripheral blood as, me as measured by PCR-based methods or after the first two blocks uh, can be prognostically important, but this has not been used uh, in our international multicenter trials yet. But when you say smears, this would mean to me that you are talking about, about morphology uh, and morphology is not something that you can use to monitor a disease response, even not in BLL, in peripheral, but of course in BLL cases, you can use bone marrow, to, uh, you must use bone marrow to assess the treatment response. I hope that I understood the, the question correctly. But perhaps yes. Angus and, 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 and Monica can add something to that. Yeah, uh, I, I certainly agree entirely. And um, I think T cell lymphoblastic leukemia lymphoma is the only disease where what you see in the peripheral blood reflects the marrow. And you can get prognostic significance from um, peripheral blood MRDs. So, certainly in Burkitt's, we've never used it and never have sought to use it. 
because I don't think peripheral blood MRD has any prognostic significance in uh, uh, Burkitt lymphoma. Do, do you have any comment on that, uh, Murti? Yes, doctor, about the, yeah, how to, uh, what, a, what the problem that uh, sometimes we have to, to refer or access from the patient to go to the uh, cancer center. But now we have the, uh, like, uh, uh, insurance from government insurance. So all the patient, all the patient uh, covered by government insurance. And then uh, uh, sometimes uh, we can also the problem is about the early detection that uh, from the the general uh, doctor or general pediatrician because in our uh, in rural area sometimes it's uh, very rare to find the case uh, with the malignancy so sometimes they try to 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 try to to give the treatment first and then uh, after that uh, no uh, uh, no uh, it's not uh, better so after that uh, they will refer to to the cancer center but it is uh, this is very very difficult how to educate the general doctor uh, how to uh, know about the early detection and then that's why uh, uh, we always uh, educate the, I mean, the from the medical side, uh, when you doubt about the, this is malignancy or this is uh, benign, and then we have to think first, this is malignancy. So after you refer, and then uh, we will find out about this uh, disease, uh, make sure this is malignancy or not. So no, no, no need to just to treat, uh, 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 they think this is uh, not uh, malignancy, but uh, like the, the case that the Dr. Manga presentation, uh, this is the delayed diagnosis, so maybe can impact the, uh, from the outcome from the patient. So now we have the insurance, government insurance, that uh, all, all the treatment uh, from uh, malignancy patient can cover by the government. So this is a very, very uh, uh, get the uh, benefit for for our uh, for our patients. There was a, a couple of questions about how we can improve the time to diagnosis. Uh, Dr. Belgami, do you have any comments on that, especially in a low and middle income situation? Well, um, I think that is the critical thing in Burkitt lymphoma is as, as, as you know, all of us have been saying that there is a certain urgency that's required within there. Um, and, and really what many of the comments that have been answered and what has been said here is that the, the requirement um, for a strong suspicion or a diagnosis of Burkitt lymphoma uh, is fairly small. Um, a lot of what we can do is, can be based on a clinical presentation of the patient, um, and simple things, as as Dr. Atharbashi has been saying, you know, touch preps, um, using you know just just smears or looking at the side of spin of a uh, acidic fluid, for example, can lead to a diagnosis for these patients. Um, so really, what 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 is required is is um, is is an is a, is is the knowledge of the disease itself. And the knowledge of potential of people who would potentially see these patients before they refer to the oncologist or the oncology center. Um, and this could be surgeons. I mean, almost all intestinal obstructions will be referred to a surgeon initially. Um, uh, any patient who comes in with uh, cervical lymphadenopathy um, will be initially in a lot of places treated as, as, as tuberculosis. Before it goes on, we see that a lot with Hodgkin lymphoma more than non-Hodgkin lymphoma. But yes, that's what it is. So your 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 index of suspicion really needs to be there. Um, and so really, I think a lot of it can be circumvented with just education, as we are doing right now. Um, and 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 that that knowledge uh, will allow for these patients to be referred earlier on. Uh, there really isn't any huge requirement. Um, for, for, for infrastructure for treatment of Burkitt lymphoma. Dr. Susayla, 
Do you, do you have any comments on that, how we can help improve the situation? So there was a question about how to improve the situation in low to middle income countries. I wonder if you have any comments on that. Thank you for your uh, contribution, yes. Dr. Belgami. Uh, I would uh, agree with what uh, Asim sir told now, because uh, our patient, he was seen by a primary surgeon, because uh, in our setup, usually when uh, somebody has an abdomen pain symptoms, it is usually seen by a surgeon. And uh, like he presented with an intestinal obstruction like features and an emergency situation. So he operated on him. So, and uh, the primary diagnosis, uh, he uh, underwent an imaging prior to the surgery and it's uh, noted a diffuse bowel thickening. So in our country, the first diagnosis will be an abdominal tuberculosis uh, because it is an ileocecal region. An abdomen TB will be the first uh, thing a surgeon will think of. And with an obstruction, he operated on the child. So. And there are multiple lapses in the uh, subsequent events. The, uh, the setup wise, it was operated by a primary surgeon. So they had sent for histopathology. And usually if it is a tertiary center equipped with histopathology, uh, adequate follow-up, like it, if it is an R, it, in our center, the same patient is operated. The Burkitt's leukemia, uh, sorry, Burkitt's lymphoma is an alert for us. Immediately they'll uh, call, call up from pathology department and they'll tell us, uh, it is buckets like that. So this is like, it was uh, sent to a uh, pathology lab for processing and uh, it would have been come uh, come after two, three weeks. By that time, the patient was asymptomatic. So they, the patients, we cannot blame. They thought they are cured of the problem and uh, they were okay. So that system, uh, for um, we can probably inform all the pathology lab processings that if you find out a lymphoma, you have to inform the primary surgeon and also we can increase the awareness among the primary surgeons with an abdomen mass we always have in back of the mind uh, lymphoma as a diagnosis differential that uh, that's what i wanted to tell thank you um yeah one of the things that cyp has tried to do is trying to uh, help early diagnosis so this is the whole theme of the CEDA webinar. So we're not targeting paediatric oncologists. We're targeting trying to inform other healthcare professionals. So diagnosis of cancer take place earlier. So this is exactly supporting what Belgam, Dr. Belgami and what the other panelists have been saying. So SI in conjunction with the IPA are trying to help people, give them the knowledge to diagnose children quicker. So it's not a massive change, it, but it's it's all about education. Uh, Angus and, and Monica can also com comment on this. I think uh, the, the the care of children with cancer in 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 the Western countries has definitely improved by our teaching of the pediatric surgeons. So if uh, patients present to them uh, uh, to them uh, at the beginning of their disease. Uh, we have trained them that they should involve us from the beginning onwards so that we are involved in the planning of the operation. And we usually send one of our pediatric oncologists to the operation room to be there and, and to, uh, to, to see what the, what the surgeon is doing and to decide what to do with the material to send uh, their stitches to this lab and the, the samples to, 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 to the pathology. So, Training of the pediatric surgeon, if this is in Africa the case, what I'm understanding now is that many patients pre present to the surgeons uh, primarily, is that you train uh, and, and teach the, the surgeons, that they involve you as the pediatric oncologist from the beginning onwards. Monica, you would like to add something? Yes, no, I, I totally, totally agree with you, Andisha, and I think I think we need to start to think about us as, as colleagues all and that we are teams. So we don't work in silos, we work in teams. And communication, everything turns around communication always, right? So, so I think, um, I think it is to, to start having more open discussions and, and a culture of communication within, the, within their, your own hospitals. Um, and letting everybody know that that all the patients are shared because at any given time, my patient could become your patient and vice versa. So there are a few questions that people have asked that we I don't think we're going to have a chance to answer. If people 
leave their email address and we, we will get back to you afterwards. So I think um, that's the that's the end of the question and answer session. Thank you for your contribution, everyone. I'll just share my screen. So there's the CME credit for everyone that attended this one. Um, if there's any further questions about this seminar, then please email uh, Dr. Sagir Khan. He's been instrumental in running these CEDAR webinars. They wouldn't have happened without his uh, great work. There's video, all the previous CEDAR webinars are available on the SIAP YouTube channel. This one will be available on there soon, and they're available in English, and they have the Spanish subtitles. The next seminar is on Friday the 10th of March, and that's the diagnosis and referral of Wilms tumour. And it takes the same format as this one with world leading experts um, doing presentations, and then there'll be a question and answer session. And this is on Wilms tumour. And together with the IP for the ICCD, ICCD 2023, the IPA and SIAP have done a, a series of videos about childhood cancer, and these are being promoted through social media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and TikTok. The first video has been produced by SIAP president, Guillermo Chantada, and I think we're just going to see it now. These are just short videos. There's only one that's been published so far, but there's going to be a lot more coming soon. Good cancer is curable. Uh, we have great possibilities of survival. The results in high income countries show that around 80 to 85 percent of the children with cancer can be cured. However, there are very big differences around the world. In many countries, because of late diagnosis, because of cultural uh, issues that um, make that the families will not accept the treatment that we propose, sometimes because of the health uh, system is not adequate enough to, to treat the children with cancer. Unfortunately, in many countries in the world, despite childhood cancer is curable, children are not being cured. So that's why there is a big effort right now, a big global effort around the world, with the WHO to achieve at least 60% survival in the six index cancers that are more curable. We are aiming to cure 60% of these children. However, in high income countries, uh, the cure rate for these children is about 90%. So yes, childhood cancer is curable, but we should cure childhood cancer around the world right now. Sorry, I think that's over to Angus now to finish up. Yes, yeah. Um, just really to conclude, I have to say I've been blown away by the quality of the, the presentations and the discussion. It absolutely reflects what we do in Dublin with close to unlimited resources. Um, I think the principles of good clinical medicine are the same everywhere. So well done to the panellists and uh, the moderators and the presenters. Um, I'm glad this is going to be on YouTube. And the next Burkitt patient we have in in Dublin, I will send my team off to look at YouTube and to review this um, uh, this presentation as a very good grounding in what to do when the patient hits the uh, the tertiary care centre. So thank you, everybody. I've been very very impressed, and um, special thanks to Claudia for her moderatorship and her impeccable timekeeping. Thank you, Dr. Angus, and thank you, everyone, for being here with us today and sharing your, your knowledge and uh, all the participants for sharing their time with us. Uh, we want to improve our knowledge and uh, to, to know more about this, this disease and improve the outcomes of our patients. See you in the next webinar. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.